My name is Jaakko Halmetaja. I'm one of the authors of best-selling books Biohacker's Handbook and Biohacking Stress. And I'm just super stoked to be here near Lempala, which is 10 minutes drive from Tampere, which is one of the biggest cities in Finland, which is pretty impressive that you can get into the nature so quickly. And one of the first things that you realize when you come to the forest is how your, let's say, your cognitive ergonomy changes. Your mind kind of relaxes a little bit. And when you look at the studies, why this happens, one of the key reasons is the smells. Especially if I look at the spruce and pines and the, the trees that produce resin and, and these different essential oils, these terpenes. When you smell this scents in the forest, it kind of actually reduces um, your nervousness. So for a biohacker, it's fun that we can measure these things. For example, I have a, um, this smart ring that's produced by a company, Finnish company called Aura, that measures my heart rate variability, different markers for, for example, that kind of give a, give a picture how my nervous system is acting in different situations. So what's been noticed in this community is that whenever you just go to the forest, the nervous system calms down, the heart rate variability goes up, your parasympathetic nervous system activates more, and it's of course really good for your health. <laughs> so for me it's interesting that how simple some of the most profound things, for example, for stress management are. And, uh, for example, in Japan they have this concept of um, Shinrin-yoku or forest bathing, which basically says that for every hour you spend inside at the office, go for a five minutes into nature, into park. And in Finland we have this privilege that it's actually pretty accessible and you get, get to the really nice places, not just a park or something. So. Whenever I come to these kind of locations, and especially with the open fire and all that, you don't have to be here very long to actually kind of reset your emotional state, your nervous system, your blood pressure goes down. There are many physiological things that happen just when you go to the nature. And if you do it with your good friend, have a conversation, drink something good and all that, it's, it's perfect. So I'm just glad to be here. So I often get asked that what are the top wild foods from the Finnish forest? Whether it was a reporter or a friend, people want to know like what you can eat from the wild. And in Finland, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is berries. And this is a privilege for us because we still have wild berries. And for me, for example, the blueberry that people get from the grocery stores all across the world they're called blueberries. And in Finland, the wild blueberries are called bilberries. So it's a different kind of a subspecies. It's a wild variety that has more of these anthocyanins, these color pigments that are really good for your health. So we have plenty of wild berries. And that's, that's the thing that always reminds me when I come from other countries with a nutrition expert or somebody, and they are just like, what? You, you actually have wild berries in your small grocery stores. And that's pretty unbelievable for many people, especially at the price point that we have. So that's one of the categories in nutrition that basically everybody in biohacking community, in all kinds of nutritional approaches, approaches are kind of like, well, berries, they are pretty good stuff. So that's a big category and we have pretty pretty special ones, cloud berries, of course, lingon berries. These things are not widely available everywhere. But in Finland, people just, well, I got it from my grandma. And <laughs> so that's a huge category that we should eat more because it's like in Finland, the sauna. People go to sauna, but according to studies, if you go to sauna more than four times a week, the benefits are drastically different. So with the berries, it's the same, same thing. You can eat a few tablespoons of, of berries a day, but if you start eating 200 grams, 150 grams or more per day, 
The health benefits, for example, for reducing blood pressure are tre tremendously more effective. Another category is, of course, all the wild herbs. And when I think about kind of the most powerful ones in terms of, of biohackers eyes, like reducing stress and adapting me to a different situations, we have in Lapland especially this wild herb called Rhodiola rosea or rose root. Then of course the category of, of mushrooms. That's all often overlooked, but for me that's one of the coolest things in a forest because you are not just looking down what, what's there, but the category of so-called medicinal mushrooms often means that there are polypores that grow on trees that produce very interesting chemistry, especially for our immune system. So it helps our immune system to function kind of more adaptably. And a good example is something that we're going to do next. We're going to boil chaga mushroom, which was used during the World Wars as a coffee substitute. So it's this dark coffee-like uh, liquid that you can just drink. It actually tastes very good and it has many health benefits, especially for your gut, your immune function and some people for your skin. So now we're going to demonstrate how we boil traditional chaga mushroom tea. Yeah, I think we're ready. So in biohacking community all over the world, there is a big fuzz about cold. How does cryotherapy or cold showers, ice dipping actually affect your body? And why it's so popular in this group of people? Well, first, in cybernetics, there is this term of, of feedback loops. So if you call the cold, cold water, it's a perfect feedback loop for your breathing. And if you actually want to um, kind of train your nervous system, the breathing exercises, that's the whole thing. So cold, that type of challenging environment, challenges ourselves to actually control our breathing better. Another thing is, of course, you feel pretty amazing when you come out of the cold shower or cryo chamber or the ice bath. And that's because there's so many chemicals going on, mainly the rush of endogenous, so the, the chemicals that body produces itself, endogenous morphines, endorphins. So th those are really good for lowering inflammation, pain relief, just the kind of a bliss that you get after the cold. And then, of course, there is an increase of noradrenaline, dopamine, many of these kind of single molecules that kind of give you, give you this more sharp and more kind of a stable crown to stand on. And for me, cold has always been kind of a emotional reset button. Whenever you're kind of out there and not that centered, when you dip into the water and come out, you're just like, oh, all good. And here in Finland, in the land of a thousand lakes, that's a privilege. We have cold lakes everywhere and the long winter actually is an asset. Whether it was a cryotherapy, whether it was dipping in the ice, cold water or cold showers, your body benefits a lot when you give this little shock to it, this so-called hormetic stressor. And cold activates many of the super beneficial 
chemical bursts, for example, called endorphins, called noradrenaline, that also makes your tissues more metabolically active in the future. So we kind of induce this brown adipose tissue. The health benefits are tremendous. And for example, for me, as a very active person, my mind starts to wander around and sometimes cold just changes my physiological state in a way that's kind of a emotional reset button. I come from here and everything is just good. Hi, my name is Sammy Torberg. I'm a chef, forager and biohacker. And why foraging? Uh, when you happen to live in Finland, foraging is, I think, one of the best things you can do here. And when you forage, it's not just about you picking some herbs to put on the plates that you have already prepared. It's finding extremely nutritional food for yourself, for your family, for your friends, and then spending time in nature. So living the nature connection, which is the ultimate thing about being in Finland. And when we use forage stuff, it's not just, uh, it's not just uh, nutrient dense, but it's also environmentally friendly, it's ethical, and it's really that that's good for us when we live in this part of the world, to eat the food that wild nature around us provides us. It's very important that when you go foraging that you really identify what's good for eating and what's not good because we have also poisonous plants and we have 20 odd deadly poisonous plants so you need to use let's say wild herb cookbook or there are other cookbooks as well now other wild herb kind of a <clears throat> info leaflets and there's a web service called naturegate.net so that's the one I've been using always naturegate.net and uh, <clears throat> I use that and then once I've <clears throat> discovered that this plant is edible, then I think about that how the, uh, the flavor reminds me, what the flavor reminds me of. Let's say we have lots of plants that are similar to wild rocket and then some of the plants like roses are aromatic and so on. And in fact, I have divided these uh, wild herbs into four categories. First one is the salad leaves, so the plants that can be used as salad leaves and the second one is plants that could be used like herbs, let's say rosemary and thyme kind of. And then there's a third one which is substantial vegetables. So they're very similar to, let's say, you know, this tender stem broccolini and stuff like that. And then the fourth one is aromatic plants, shrubs and trees, which is basically rose petals and polypody and spruce and that kind of stuff. So those four categories are autom automatically in my mind when I find stuff then I discover how to use them. Seasonality, it's a great thing to think about a little bit deeper, not just that, oh, now it's in season, we can use it. But basically the foraging season starts in April and then it carries on May, June, July, August, September, October, and even November. So it's actually, this foraging thing is not just something you can do in spring, but it actually lasts for eight months. And when you combine all the herbs, uh, <clears throat> trees and berries and mushrooms, the range is amazing. So seasonality, it's a long, it's an eight month period. And then plants, they are always in different stage. So let's say in early spring, you can use the roots and then the shoots. And then later on the whole plants, like up to, let's say 15 centimeters. And then when they start producing flowers, then the flower bud stage is like substantial vegetable. And then later on the flowers are to be used and then even later seeds are to be used. So my favorite herbs and mushrooms in terms of functional food and drinks are basically the plants that I've been gathering from Lapland because the sunlight is so intense that summertime there's basically two months, 60 days non-stop sunlight and then combined with that are the cool nights. So the active ingredients in those medicinal plants up in Lapland become very high. So let's say Rose root is one of those, it's adaptogenic herb that gives you very subtle and long lasting energy. So instead of having coffee, like a really quick peak and then later on quite heavy crash, the rose root gives you just a long lasting and even energy throughout the day. 
And then another plant I would like to mention is tall Jacob's Ladder. And it's, there's a nickname for that called Greek Valerian. And it's actually very, uh, very uh, relaxing and gives you very deep and uh, clear sleep. So you rest really well in the night. And also, Jaga is something I like to mix with coffee when I drink coffee. And Jaga is something I really look up to. But there is uh, <clears throat> another mushroom, polypore, called a uh, reishi, which is something I have happened to come across even more often than Jaga. And Jaga is called the king of all mushrooms, and reishi is called queen of all mushrooms. And the, uh, the reishi is something that I have always found like decent amounts. So I have my homemade extract of reishi and I use that if not regularly, like once a week, maybe once every two weeks. And then when I cook dinners, like high quality dinners, I always include wild reishi, something that is part of my uh, cooking and lifestyle. And risks. So we have definitely risks. And uh, it's about identifying the plants, but that's really about the only risk I can think of. You need to be very careful because there are deadly, deadly poisonous plants as well. But the main risk I would like to highlight is the well-being. So you will be noticing that you are actually finding the balance when you're in nature. So that's the risk that your well-being increases dramatically.